Well, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our webinar this morning for Succeed Before You Start Toolkit Overview. My name is Ashley Daga, and I am a CalTAP training coordinator here with CalVet. Uh, we are very excited for you to be joining us this morning. And um, I just wanted to let you know that we do have a list of upcoming webinars. Um, and, and I'll be able to show you that here on our website here shortly. And let's see here. Okay, and so here is our website where you can find all of our webinars, um, all the hit, all the past ones, and um, most of them are recorded. And so you can just go here and kind of see what our schedule is going to be like for the upcoming ones as well. All right, and so a few housekeeping things. So um, last night, uh, you should have received an email, and within that email, you would have received a PDF version of our resource book here. And in this resource book, there are tons of great resources and information for you as a veteran and in addition to your family as well. And in, on this PDF, you'll also at the, the last page, you'll find our phone number and you'll be able to give us a call and either one of the staff here at Caltab will answer the phone line. Um, but as of right now, it will be um, our links who are answering the phone lines. And um, the links are the local interagency network coordinators. And speaking of links, um, you should have also received a link map. So within, you'll be able to find your link within your region that you can contact um, and see what kind of resources they have available for you. In addition to that, you should have received our agenda. So in our agenda, um, I'll be going over the CalTAP overview and how to utilize the CalTAP website. And then we'll have Ben Gales from Orange County, who is the link there, uh, come on and tell you some information in regards to what the links are doing during this time. And then lastly, Victor and Zunza from uh, Swords to Plowshares will come on and give some information in regards to um, his, his, his information. All right, and so let's see here. Okay, so within the email, you would have also received a packet or PDF that shows you information on how to uh, use a chat function. So we ask that you have, that you utilize a chat function within um, Zoom if you have any questions. And um, you can ask the questions throughout the whole webinar, or you can wait to the end when we have our virtual Q&A. And at that time, we'll, um, we will disseminate any questions to the subject matter expert and give you um, so that they can answer the question for you. But again, if you don't, if you've never used um, Zoom and you, what you can do is if you scroll down to the bottom of your screen, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll find the chat function there and you can go ahead and type the chat function in. And we have um, our CalTAP veteran service rep here who will be um, pushing those questions out. Uh, we also do ask that you keep your um, video off during the presentation just so that um, it helps with the presenters and not getting distracted um, throughout the whole presentation. All righty. And so again, this is our contact information. If you have any questions, um, you can also email us as well. We have representatives who come on and check our emails and answer them on a daily basis. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get into the CalTAP overview here. And so the CalTAP, what, Cal, what is CalTAP? So CalTAP is just basically we're here to inform and connect veterans of all eras, including their family members with the benefits um, state and federal that they have earned through their military career uh, or while serving. And we do that through our four pathways, uh, core curriculum, education, employment, and entrepreneurship. And so to find our website, you just go to Google and you would type in CalVet and we are the first one that pops up. So you'll click on that. And this is what our new and improved website looks like. And um, on this, on your homepage, if you scroll down, um, you'll find uh, publications down at the bottom and you can also grab the veterans resource book. So if you don't have it in your phone or, or you want to let someone know about this, you can let them know to go to our website and the veterans resource book is available for you to download. And then again, this is what our veterans resource book looks like. All right. And so to find, once you're on our website to find CalTAP, if you just scroll down a little bit and you'll find CalTAP right there, as you can see on your screen. Um, and then once you click on that, it'll take you to our um, page where all of our curriculum pathways located at. 
All right, and so how to use CalTAP online. So once again, once you're on our homepage here where the pathways are located, um, you can click on one of the pathways. So I'm gonna click on core curriculum and then you'll see all of our different modules that we have available for you. I'll go ahead and click on module five here, which is your California benefits. And then it'll take you to um, the page where you can view a video. Um, it has some great information on there. And then it also has some lessons, um, some PDFs that you can upload or download um, to view at your convenience. For this sake, I'm gonna go ahead and open up Cal California State Benefits Overview. And then this is just a brief overview, um, as you can see here of your um, the college tuition fee waiver and then some information in regards to motor vehicle registration. So this is just a quick snippet of what you'll find on our website. All right, and so at this time, um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Ben Gales, our local interagency network coordinator. And um, Ben, you should be unmuted by now. Actually, it's saying that um, I can't start my video. Do you want me to click it again? There we go. Um, try that now. There we go. I uh, see. Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks, Ashley. Again, my name is Ben Gales. At CalVet, I'm what we call a link. Um, one of the most important jobs of a link is to provide information about benefits and services for veterans, uh, service members, and their families. Uh, these days, we're doing a lot of that by phone and email, and that's a way that uh, we can help you as well if you would like. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is our link map. Um, it divides the state into eight link regions. So we have eight links across the state. So you can take a second uh, if you'd like to see where your link is based on where you live. And we have our email addresses there if you'd like to contact us. Our link regions can vary a good amount um, in terms of size and um, somewhat in terms of number of veterans. Um, but what is true for all of our regions is that all of us as links become experts in what's happening in our different territories. So if you contact us, we have a good sense and feel and, and knowledge of, of what's there and, and how to help connect you with um, services that can help. Next slide, please. Okay, so what do we do as links? Uh, we provide outreach to service members, veterans and their families. We wanna connect, uh, we wanna be helpful. Um, we make referrals and we work directly with established service provider networks. So one thing about how we work is we're very involved in our communities. So we work very closely with different service providers. So when we make referrals for you, it's not because we've read about organizations on the internet, it's because we actually literally work hand in hand with folks in our communities, which gives us a, a much better ability to understand the services uh, that are out there. We assist with local emergencies. Uh, in the past, links have done a lot of great work helping with California wildfires and other things. Um, certainly COVID-19, obviously not just local, but at a local level, one thing we're doing right now is we're keeping track of the status of different service providers across the state that help veterans and their families. Um, so that helps us understand how they're impacted by COVID-19 and how that affects services that can be available for you. And then finally, we provide leadership and advocacy to local communities. So there's a lot of different collaborative organizations around the state that work on um, trying to figure out how to better strategize and coordinate to help veterans with different services. So we're pretty involved in that work. And that, again, is something that helps put us in a position to really have kind of an inside lane on understanding different services that are out there that can help. Okay, so connecting to benefits. So what kind of services are out there that we can connect you to? Well, on the employment and training side, uh, we have the EDD, Employment Development Department. They have a lot of programs around the state to help veterans with things like finding jobs, uh, preparing resumes, um, mock interviews, overall job strategy, okay? These entities are um, called America's Job Centers of California, often also called One Stops. In addition to the EDDs, there's a wide range of nonprofit organizations out there that help veterans with employment. Um, so there's, there's some options that you can look into. Um, on the California State Benefits side, 
I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our different benefits, but first I just want to talk about something that's important to know about, and it's called the County Veterans Service Offices. So all counties have what we call CVSO offices, and these offices are really a gateway for you to access a range of federal and state benefits. Okay, so they're, they're, most of these offices are working remotely. And actually that's a general theme for really most of the services um, that you can contact now is that they're, they're functioning remotely. Um, most are still active. And so that, that's just good to know that, that, that that's there. But CVSO offices are in that same boat and really can be valuable in terms of making connections. Um, you know, this is an example of you know, something a CVSO can do for you. They can help you establish a service-connected disability rating um, based upon some kind of physical or mental health um, issue that's arisen from your service. And that can carry a lot of benefits. Um, Tax-free cash, obviously a good one, but access, um, access to some other benefits as well. So what are some of our, our state benefits at CalVet? I'll just go through a couple real quickly. Um, very popular, the uh, college fee waiver that can provide education assistance for dependents, uh, the CalVet home loan, um, advantages for veterans in employment and entrepreneurship as well, and really a lot more, especially as you, um, if you can establish a service-connected rating um, in terms of some other benefits. Uh, on the healthcare side, uh, we work closely with uh, VA Medical Center staff. Um, VAs are still operating. Um, VAs also have what are called community-based outpatient clinics, or CBOX for short, that can provide assistance. Uh, VAs also have what are called vet centers. Uh, these are the VA's mental health centers. I'll make an important point on mental health services. Obviously, this is not a time to be shy about getting mental health services if you feel like that would be helpful. And again, just because physical locations are closed doesn't mean these, that these services are not accessible. Okay, and so it's not just the VA, it's a, a wide range of nonprofits that can provide these services. And so this is an example of something, if you're interested in finding out what's out there, uh, reach out to your link. That, that's a really important part of our job is to understand where those services are. And in some cases, they can also provide services to um, family members of veterans as well on the mental health side. A couple other benefits, housing, um, if you're, especially if you're dealing with homelessness, reach out to us. There's a wide range of programs out there that can help veterans who are facing homelessness, things like HUD-VASH, SSVF, um, so stands for Supportive Services for Veteran Families that can do a lot in terms of rapid rehousing. And also right now with COVID-19 has increased ability to utilize motels and hotels for emergency housing. So that's definitely one. Um, you know, again, don't be shy in terms of reaching out if, if we can provide help there. Okay, next slide, Ashley. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're just back to our map here. Um, again, just to bring it home, I've said it a few times, please don't be shy about contacting us. Um, it's a really important part of what we're doing right now. We're, we're fielding call, calls and emails all the time. And uh, we wanna hear from you. And I think that's it for me for now. Thanks, Ashley. All right, thank you so much, Ben. Um, so at this time, oh, and again, sorry about that, I didn't go to the last slide, but this is Ben's contact information. If you guys have any questions, you can reach him, either him or you can contact him there, um, and then there's his email as well. All right, so at this time, we're gonna go ahead and move on to um, Swords Plowshare, uh, Victor Nzunza, I hope I said that right. Um, he will come on and give you his information in regards to what Swords Plowshare can help you with and some information in regards to overview. All right, and Victor, you should be unmuted at this point. Okay, great. Perfect. Thank you. So um, to just start off, one of the main things that we wanted to achieve with this toolkit was to give veterans some basic skills that they can apply to their journey forward into college, into their career afterwards, but during that period also to help keep them somewhat financially stable. We found that a lot of veterans, um, as we went along in our studies, we've been doing this for about four years in education, had concerns about finances. So it was something that continually came up, but it was just until this last study that we did that we started to really see it emerge more and we wanted to um, inquire about it further to see what what else was there to look at so that's how we ended up with this toolkit um, we, how we ended up with the research that we have so 
If you could just advance to the next slide, please. So my name is Victor Nzunza. I'm a policy analyst for Swords of Plowshares. I've been working with Swords for about four years now. I work in the Institute for Veteran Policy. I'm also a Marine Corps veteran. Uh, I served two years in Iraq, or sorry, not two years, two tours. That would have been a really long tour. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, so two tours in Iraq. And I came back to my hometown, Stockton, California, went to college at University of the Pacific, got a bachelor's in English, and then um, I got a scholarship to University of San Francisco and decided to move here full time. Um, during that time, I did find out about SWORDS through their services. So I was actually a client before I became an employee here. Um, so it's one way that I can attest to um, the great services that we do provide. And so I'm really thankful to be a part of this team. Next slide, please. So essentially what we're gonna cover here is uh, ways that you can maximize your GI Bill benefits. Uh, one of the things that I wanna make clear is that there are limitations and I'll touch on that further, uh, but folks can find ways to work within those constraints. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, additionally, on-campus supports are really important for veterans. If they don't stay connected, they can't really be successful in their careers in college. Uh, so it's important, uh, despite the fact that a lot of us are, are kind of used to being self-sufficient and things like that, that we rely on others as well. Uh, additionally, as I said, with our most current research, we wanted to help veterans to develop financial skill sets and learn how to manage debt properly. So all of this is really coming from students themselves that have shared their best tips for, for achieving this. And um, so it's firsthand experience and then our observation included. Next slide. Uh, so as I, I stated briefly earlier with um, the GI Bill, uh, there are limitations to it. It is, is in fact a really great benefit that we have as veterans. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't mean to say anything negative about the bill. I think that it's great. I think there are improvements that can be made. So that's sort of what we're going to touch on. Um, and again, like I said, working within those constraints because uh, the reality is that just the benefits alone typically are not enough to get veterans through the entire college experience. I think there's another bullet if you can click forward. Thank you. Oh, too far. Okay. Um, so also, there are a lot of things that people don't necessarily understand as far as myths are concerned. So it's, it's not that veterans just, you know, transition out from the military and immediately start receiving benefits. Um, that's just not the case. Uh, a lot of what happens is there is an administrative process. You do have to fill out forms. You do have to contact schools to get further information. You have to apply. So it's, it's a longer process than people might, um, might think initially. So for the veterans themselves, they have to be aware of that. And so that prior information is really important. Um, additionally, it's like I said, it's just not automatic. It's, you don't walk through the door of any college and, and immediately get your GI Bill benefits. It just doesn't work that way. Um, next slide. So with our research, what we've done so far, and we've done this for a few years now, is that we've relied on focus groups a lot with veterans to kind of uh, discuss these issues and see what their perspectives were. Uh, this time around, we also did a round of research workshops, uh, which were really more collaborative in nature and allowed us to get feedback on what should actually be done to make changes um, either to the GI Bill or um, how veterans can succeed financially. So all of these things help to contribute to the toolkit that we have and the report that we've finished. Um, so a lot of this was just you know, hands-on talking to veterans, discussing their approaches, trying to get ideas to share with other veterans, um, learning from mistakes. So a lot of veterans did share some of their difficulties that they had during their time in college and some of the challenges that they faced, how they overcame them, things like that were um, incredibly useful and allowed us to provide some recommendations. Next slide. Okay, so um, there's, always, there's always unexpected circumstances, um, typically when it's related to financial aid or GI Bill payments. Um, I know that when I was in school, there were issues with overpayment, there were issues with delays, um, financial aid, 
is not always something you can depend on 100%. So you've got to go through that process, which is a separate one. It's not through the through the Veterans Benefit Administration. So uh, that can be kind of un, you know unfamiliar to a lot of veterans. So that's something that, that they might have to adapt to. Uh, but like we said, veteran education benefits won't most likely cover everything. So what veterans have to do is find ways to supplement those expenses. Uh, really one of the other things that we'll touch on is, is that there are other expenses that people aren't necessarily aware of that are associated with college. Um, it's not just paying tuition. Um, books is something that are pretty much considered you know, an, a normal expense, but there are a lot of other things that fall into those categories. So one of the other things is that we have limitations as far as the GI Bill itself, so 36 months. Right, may not be enough for some programs. Um, a lot of what we heard throughout our research was that uh, more technical programs, you know, medical programs, things like uh, STEM and other, other programs that may take longer uh, require the veterans to find some other way to, to pay for the, the last few months of their degree. Um, also, there are differences between active duty and reservists. So what, what type of uh, benefits they have and how how much they are covered uh, for for their time in school. So for myself, I was active duty, and I, I got the full 36 months, uh, no problem there. But um, some some people don't get that full benefit. Uh, additionally, basic allowance for housing can be really tricky because, for example, in the Bay Area where where I live, uh, students that that go to school here are having a really hard time meeting the um, the higher rents that, that exist here. So even though you may have a, a pretty generous VAH um, in the market that we have here in, in San Francisco or, or the larger Bay Area, it's, it's simply not enough um, to cover everything. Um, additionally, it's incredibly competitive here. And I know that we're not isolated in that um, experience or, or places all over the country that have that similar problem. Next slide. So um, a lot of this has to do with the gaps in um, funding. So um, if you remember um, being in college, there are breaks in between. You're not just going to school you know, the entire year. There are winter breaks, summer breaks. And the difficulty there is that the veterans who are, are in school, um, during those gap months, they're not getting paid their BAH. So, when those, when those situations arise, they have to find some other way um, to supplement that income. Most of the students that we've talked to have done part-time work or some sort of paid internship, or they borrowed money and things like that. So that's an, that's an area that we've, we've discovered um, a limitation in the GI Bill and something that we hope to make changes to in the future. Um, the reality is that rent doesn't stop necessarily just because um, the benefits do. So one of the things we're concerned with are the material realities that are involved in this. So um, this is a complex situation. If someone's in school for four years or longer, um, they have to be supported. Um, and, and in the realm of housing, it's, it's much more critical because we're working, at a at, we're working with the at-risk population. And so the likelihood that veterans may become homeless because of something like that is pretty high. Um, we've seen it happen, happen during our studies, so veterans that we've talked to have experienced that, and that's just not something we want to see. Commutes was another expense that doesn't really get a lot of attention, um, but it can take a heavy toll. Um, like I said previously, with higher rents being a factor, a lot of the students are forced to live outside of the area where they go to school. And so this means longer commutes, which can mean uh, much more stress to them during an already stressful time. College is certainly demanding, uh, you need to sleep, you need to manage your stress. Um, and it's very difficult to do that if you're commuting an hour. I've heard of folks commuting from, you know, from Davis or all the way from Stockton, Sacramento, all over the place just to come to school in the Bay Area. But those expenses, you know, aren't isolated to just bridge tolls and things like that. It, you know, it can be wear and tear on the car, gas, of course, is an, a pretty obvious expense but all of these things kind of factor into additional expenses that the veteran will have um, that they might not have if they live much, much more locally. 
And also another important thing to consider is that this isn't something that's covered by the GI Bill as well. Next slide. So again, um, I kind of teased this out a bit earlier. And so the important thing here is that with Succeed Before You Start, we want folks to have a plan before they even get to the, the process of going through college or applying for benefits or any of that. We'd hope that they would get this information early. Um, so that's kind of the job of, of advocates like ourselves to try to get that information out there in the world. Um, we can distribute that information as best we can and hopefully um, when necessary, you know, provide outreach and direct contact with veterans and, and let them know what's, what's ahead of them so that they can prepare for it. So, you know, as we discovered earlier, GI Bill is not going to cover everything. So with that, you know, in consideration, we're going to talk through a few ways that you can prepare for that. Um, so if you, if you look here to the left, you'll see that it does cover most. So I like to think of it like this. So you, you need a base financial income to go to college, no matter what you do. So even if you're not a veteran, you have to provide some sort of savings. You have to have a backup plan. Um, some people are lucky enough to get a scholarship. Some people aren't. Um, some people can apply for grants and things like that uh, to help supplement that cost. Um, but all in all, they're going to have, you know, real material needs that, that need to be addressed. So if you have housing, you're going to have to pay rent. If you have a family, you're going to have to provide for them. And um, if you have bills, of course, you have to pay them. Uh, so any of these shortfalls will, will mean that they'll come out of the, vet, the veteran's pocket. And so they have to find a way to supplement that income. Next slide, please. So uh, one of the things that I discovered when I was in the military this was sort of accidental, actually. It wasn't something that was advertised very well, but the military does provide tuition assistance. So I was active duty and I found out through uh, someone in my platoon, I believe, and they said that you could get tuition assistance for college. Um, I had done some community college before I entered the service. And when I found out about tuition assistance, uh, since I had already planned on, on getting out and going back to college, uh, I said, well, this is something I should look into. So I did. And I was able to complete you know, a, a decent amount of, of units while I was still in, in active duty, so that by the time I got to community college, I already had covered some of the things that I needed to cover, so uh, some general education requirements. So this is something that I highly recommend to people who plan on going to college, um, if, they're, if they're in active status at that point. Um, one of the other really great things uh, that I noticed um, on my base, which was Camp Lejeune, they actually had a really great connection with the local community, so there was, space on on the base proper for the community college there and so you could take courses um, in person if you wanted to so things like that can give you a head start you can click ahead now thanks go ahead and click ahead please so again so the, the living stipend that we get as far as BH is concerned, it's something that you have to consider. So we know these gap months are going to happen. So a lot of people that we talked to said that with, with that in mind, what they would do is set aside some money for those gap months. So that's a pretty simple fix for, for this uh, limitation. So again, like I said before, we, we have to work within the limitations of the GI Bill um, at present. Uh, certainly want to make adaptations in the future that will make the lives of veterans more comfortable. But at this current time, we simply just have to work within those constraints. Um, child care and transit costs, just as I said, those are not covered. A lot of our veterans have families and child care, especially in this area uh, where we live, it, it can be really, really expensive. And so that can be another supplemental uh, cost that you have to take into consideration. Go ahead and click ahead, please. So this is important too with um, you know, deciding how much you're willing to take on when you decide to go back to school. Um, I can say from personal experience, one of the, one of the really detrimental things is that 
Um, if you get out of the, the military and, and you go back to school, you find that you're much older than your peers. So one of the effects that this has is that you might feel like you're kind of running out the clock in a lot of ways. So uh, when I went back to community college, for example, I was 25 years old. Um, most of the people in my classes were 18 to 20 something, right? So, you know, I was thinking of it with that mindset that, oh, well, these people are going to finish their degrees, you know, in advance of me. A lot of people my age already are going to grad school. And so there's an impulse, which isn't necessarily realistic, to take more credits than you need to while you're in school. And it simply doesn't benefit you in the long run because the reality is that that we all have limitations ourselves and it's easy to get burned out if you keep doing this. So I always try to tell people to balance their course load accordingly, consider other factors that they have to deal with. So if you have responsibilities like family life or other work that you have to do, um, if, you, if you try too hard to, to advance um, in a short period of time, you're not going to succeed before you start, right? Go ahead and click ahead, please. So additionally, some, some tips that we have, there's always room for applying for scholarships and grants. This unfortunately is something that um, not everyone uses. Um, it's difficult sometimes to, to find these grants and scholarships, but they're out there. And one of the benefits that we have as veterans is that uh, there are a lot of grants and scholarships specifically for veterans. I'm not going to enumerate them all, but I can guarantee you when I was looking for scholarships and grants when I was in college, and all I did was look up, you know, grants for veterans, scholarships for veterans, and I had a huge list to choose from. And so there's a lot of people out there who want to help veterans get through college. And so they simply have to look for these resources and apply for them. So the books stipend is another area where, where we're a bit concerned because uh, books have gotten really expensive over the years, um, especially for some of the coursework that I described earlier, so for the sciences and for the medical field, a lot of those books can be, you know, one book could be $100 or more. So that, that's a huge expense. So if you're only getting a stipend for per semester, you're still going to have to supplement that out of pocket somehow and find ways to pay for your books. Um, some people have been able to come up with great solutions for this. So as a community effort, I like to to kind of put this out there because I think it's a great idea and I hope that other people would emulate it. But um, when I was at U University of San Francisco, um, the VFW there at the time was allowing you to provide proof of veteran status and then they would supplement some of your costs for books. I'm not sure if that's still going on, but if other VSOs could follow suit and do something like that, that's a way that we could intervene um, within the limitations of the GI Bill currently. So there's always ways that we can act um, before something has to go through Congress or, or whatever to make it simple, right, to directly act. Um, additionally, another area where people are able to be successful is by looking for paid internships, fellowships, work study. Um, at our agency, we've taken some work study folks in and it's been a really great experience to have these young people working in our office on research and really applying what they're learning in class to what we do in the office. So I think that that's a great benefit, aside from the fact that it really um, improves their experience overall. So if you can come out of college with some internship behind you or fellowship, I think it makes you more competitive. I always encourage um, younger veterans when they're going through school to definitely pursue these avenues because um, ultimately you want to make yourself more marketable once you get out. Um, also, one of the things that I did late, and this is kind of a byproduct of my, um, my, my impulse, as I said, to, to complete things early um, and to try to take on more than I needed to, I didn't apply for um, VA compensation benefits early on, and I wish that I had. Um, and so when I encounter veterans now, that's one of the first questions I ask them. So if I'm talking to students and asking them about their um, current status, you know, how they're doing, um, Asking them about applying to compensation benefits is definitely something that I do right away. Um, I do also provide them resources. Of course, I'll, I'll mention sorts of plowshares, but I also mention um, the CVSO that you know is a service to use as well, just as Ben mentioned earlier. So those are all great ways to, to use these tips and kind of get ahead. Uh, next slide, please.
So staying, staying connected on campus is important, okay? So early on, um, I think that it's, it's easy enough to kind of disappear into the larger um, mass of students that you're you know, attending school with. Um, you may want to do that. There may be some urge to kind of just back off for a while, assess the situation, and then move forward after that. A lot of uh, colleges right now are marketing themselves as, as veteran friendly. And so, of course, you know, being an, an analyst, what I wanted to do is, you know, provide some inquiry into that and what, what exactly does that mean? So with veteran friendly campuses, um, my hope is that if you call yourself a veteran friendly campus, you're also providing services for veterans, you're providing support, you're giving them a space to actually collaborate with other veterans and to share ideas and to succeed in your classes. Um, that's what I think a veteran friendly campus is. Um, additionally, I think strategic plans are important. So if the administration at large is considering veterans in their, um, in their, their goals for the year and things like that, um, also I, I think that it's, it's part of the recruitment effort. So veterans bring a lot to the table as we say um, their experiences are rich and, and having them in the classroom, um, just about every professor I've ever talked to who's had a veteran in their classroom has said that it made their classroom better. Uh, because they have that global perspective, um, a lot of times they're able to provide a, you know, a, a understandable context to what the, the material is that they're discussing in class is. So um, another thing to consider too is academic advisors are there to help you um, we don't want to have students taking classes they don't need. It's great to take, um, you know, a fun class. Why not? You know, if you're um, trying to balance your workload, like I said before. So if you're taking some really difficult classes, it might not be the worst thing to do to consider taking a creative class or um, a physical fitness class or something like that that will help to kind of help you to decompress during, during that difficult semester um, of coursework. So these are things that you want to consider, but more importantly, with working with advisors, uh, it's, it's a good way to kind of provide yourself a roadmap, um, especially since most of our student veterans um, start in community college and then transfer later. Um, that was certainly the case for, for myself. Um, I was very lucky to have a great academic advisor um, who basically sat me down and said, look, this is what you need to do if you wanna to go to a four-year college. So these are the courses you need to take and this is how long approximately it's going to take you. And periodically we checked in with each other and he tracked my prog progress and it was very simple. He was really just kind of straight to the point with it and it kept me on track. And so I'm glad that I did that early on because if I hadn't, I may have taken a bunch of classes I didn't need to take. And it might, it might have taken me much longer to get out of community college. Um, so, again, here's another area that we found is important. So, um, like we said before, the GI Bill benefit is not just automatic. You don't just walk through the door at any college and, and necessarily get your GI Bills right away. Um, you have to actually, you know, go through the process. So, there's a lot of people in that chain, and you're the first one. So, when you have to fill out your paperwork, it's a good idea to reach out to other veterans, to look online, to see how this process works, to make sure you're doing everything the right way, um, because we don't wanna have delays in getting your benefits. That's one of the problems that we've seen happen. So if you walk through the door and hand that off to the certifying official and everything is uh, squared away, then their, their job is easier. And ultimately that's what we wanna do because our certifying officials, as far as their link in the chain, they're often overworked. I've talked to a number of them all over the country and um, the influx of veterans coming back to school is really high. And that's great. I'm happy to see that because I want to see more, more students coming um, you know, out of the military and uh, working on their degrees. Um, the thing is that we do need to consider um, you know, their part of, of that process so that we can make it easier for them. Um, there are of course you know, other um, other links in the chain, if you will. And so as far as the Veterans Benefits Administration is concerned, um, you know, I want to, to make sure that I, I you know, acknowledge the fact that they've done a really great job recently. Um, and they've been pretty forthcoming as far as the data is concerned. So if you look on their website, you can actually see the improvement as far as the backlog is concerned. So um, I went to school um, roughly around 2005 
And during that time, the backlog was pretty high. There were a lot of problems. So um, I'm glad to see that that's improved. Next slide, please. So veteran resource centers are like the, the one-stop shop for a lot of these veterans uh, coming into college. So the, the problem here is that not all of the campuses have a veteran resource center or there are um, some veteran resource centers that just don't have the resources they need. Um, the services are limited and that primarily has a lot to do with funding um, and support from within the institution. So uh, that can be very difficult, but if you do have a veteran resource center, students should immediately just start there. I think starting there is really what will give you um, advantage because you get all those resources in one place and you're likely to meet other veterans who can help you. Um, especially one of the benefits is that, you know, you may be in your first year at that college, but there are likely people who've been there for a while that can kind of guide you. So you might find some good mentors there. Um, so that peer advice that seems to be really critical for veterans, uh, they, they tend to really be most receptive to peers telling them, you know, how to do such, such and such thing because they trust them initially as veterans. So there's that common um, experience and that common bond that they can share and hopefully make, make friendships and um, work through the process together. Um, Another area that, that um, we hope will improve is, you know, access to disability and support services. So things like accommodations, um, there are a lot of great um, ways that universities support people with disabilities. Um, oftentimes, veterans kind of don't like to think of themselves as disabled, but, you know, as a service-connected um, veteran, I can say that it's something you shouldn't be ashamed of. Um, if you need help, you should ask for it, and certainly, you know, it, it's difficult to do that and there's a lot of stigma around that. And so, like I said earlier, there's a self-sufficiency factor. So we're used to being um, capable of doing things on our own and that can kind of um, have a negative effect in a lot of ways once we get to college because we're sort of either too proud to ask for help or we're afraid for some reason. Um, this isn't a, a situation where you have to worry about being exposed. No one's going to disclose your, your disability status but it can help you a great deal if you're getting accommodations um, and you actually need it to, to be successful in your coursework. Next slide, please. So a lot of what um, our veterans said is pretty much fundamental knowledge, I think. It's a lot of things that um, you've probably heard before but haven't done um, in a lot of ways. So um, a lot of a lot of our veterans said that that was the thing that was either making or breaking their experience in college as far as finances were concerned. If they weren't budgeting, then they were struggling in some way. So um, if, if they had, you know, debt prior to coming into college, that was still kind of a lingering issue. If they didn't have any, um, it was pretty likely that they may accrue some sort of um, debt during that time. Um, at, in college because of all of the expenses that we talked about earlier. Um, so many of the veterans did say that they would have liked to have someone explain this process to them. Okay, so there are a lot of opportunities for that and some of them are missed opportunities. Um, it's difficult to, to capture every veteran before they get into that difficult situation. So as far as active duty is concerned, you always have TAPS, so that's a great opportunity. I'm really glad to see that CalVet's doing CalTAPS. I'm glad to be a part of that and see um, that move forward. I think that that is really critical too for our California veterans. So how do we um, get in front of them before it becomes a problem and tell them, hey, this, these are some steps you need to follow. Um, and even better that these are peers who have given this advice um, to other veterans and this is what they say. Um, so I think that that's critical as well. Um, you know, I think that being kind of self-aware helps a lot too. So if you find trends in your spending, um, it's good to be conscious of that and say, okay, well, I'm spending way too much on, on this area or I'm not budgeting enough for these bills. Um, take notice of that and try to, to address it early um, because debt is one of these things that can kind of avalanche on you. 
and it'll collapse um, before you know it. And so if you're not staying on top of it, uh, it's really, really easy to fall behind and get into a situation that you can't get out of. Next slide, please. Okay, so again, some tips. Uh, we like to provide tips when we can. So making monthly and annual budgets are great. I think if you can try to forecast for the year, um, then that's great. If you have a consistent income, so something that you can depend on that's pretty much always the same, it's a little easier to predict and kind of map out. Um, but monthly expenses typically don't change, so there are always some really fundamental little things that you have to spend money on that you know are going to be around the same money or around the same amount each month. So you're going to have, you know, your energy bills, you're going to have your cable bill, your car bill, and all these kinds of things. So if you get those all um, organized in the space where you can review them and keep track of them, definitely helps. So something like a spreadsheet could be a very good way to do this. And again, there are other tools. Um, you know, we say spreadsheet because it's pretty much the simplest way that you could possibly do this. A lot of people do rely on this. Um, and I don't think it's very hard to, to put together, but there are a lot of um, resources online to help you do this maybe a little bit easier and in a more modern way. So there are some apps out there. I'm not going to endorse any in particular, but I will say that they are out there. Um, so tracking your, your spending every month, if there are areas where you're going a little too overboard, cut back. Um, always prioritize bills and debts. So know that you have bills coming up and they need to get paid. Um, if you have, um, you know, debts like credit cards or things like that that you need to pay, um, always make sure that you're, you're staying on top of those because your credit will be much important um, later on if you want to use something like the CalVet loan to get a home uh, or, or any other, you know, sort of situation like that. You might want to plan for that. You know, the future is not too far away. Okay, it seems like it is, but it's, it's always there. And also try to, to build emergency savings. So um, this is something that you should always really do. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, you know, a, a good example here is COVID, right? So we've got um, this global pandemic that we're dealing with here. Uh, no one really anticipated that it would happen um, on this scale. And so there are, unfortunately, veterans who are having money issues during this time, maybe employment issues as well. Um, so it, it, it's a situation like this that you want to prepare for, something that you did not expect to happen. Um, but also smaller emergencies, so family emergencies, um, if your car breaks down, something like that. Um, those are all things that you want to prepare for. Um, again, you can find a financial advisor if you want something more formal. There's tons of, of free courses online on finances. Um, so on many of the online um, courses that you can take down in um, any, any site you can think of like edX or, or something like that, um, great places to find resources and, and to, to develop a plan for yourself. Uh, everyone's going to need to kind of adapt to their own, um, their own lifestyle. So some people have more expenses, some people don't. Um, and so that's just finding that baseline and really figuring out where you need to um, budget more or budget less. Next slide, please. So with student loans, um, they sort of, sometimes they become a necessity and that's just the reality. Um, it does have something to do with the limitations of the GI Bill. Um, I wouldn't put all the fault there, but college has gotten much more expensive um, and that's just the reality that we have to deal with. But um, the pros here are that it's something that you can count on. So if you, if you get a loan for school, that's great because you know the amount that you're going to get and you know how far it's going to get you through that process financially. Um, additionally, you know, it's, it's important to consider that you may apply for all the scholarships and grants in the world, but you may get none of them. That could be the worst case scenario. I don't say that to discourage anyone, I say, that people should do it no matter what. Um, lo loans are, are a good resource to have, but I say to take caution. Um, if you can, it should be your last option. Um, if you don't have to take it out, don't do it. Um, it's, just, it's just a situation where you can end up in more debt um, than you need to be. As far as the amount of money, 
Um, it's, it's a lot of money typically if you can get it, but something to really pay close, pay close attention to is, is the interest rates, because interest rates always um, tend to be an area where people fall into trouble. Uh, I would say do your best to avoid high interest. Um, choose, <clears throat> um, these tend to be, I guess, one of the things is they're a little bit safer. I won't say completely safe, but they're safer than other loans. So there's a lot of loans out there that um, can be high interest or, or predatory in nature. Um, I'll do a little bit of um, discussion about that towards the end. Uh, but these are the kinds of things you wanna watch out for. So essentially be careful when you're applying for student loans, understand why they're helpful, and understand when they might not be helpful, and just understand when you may, may or may not need to take them out. Next slide, please. So again, as we're saying um, in, this, in this area here, a loan is a loan, you ultimately have to pay it back. And uh, as I said previously, with that interest factor in place, if it's 10% or if it's 20%, it doesn't really matter. It's going to increase over time. So depending on your ability to pay it back, um, you, you will accrue some, or you will accrue some larger expenses if you wait longer. And oftentimes it's hard to actually pay it back sooner because you know the job market's kind of unpredictable sometimes. So when you get out of college, you may not get that job that you wanted. Um, if you have a long period of unemployment or something like that, you're going to have to find ways to actually pay that on time. So that's something to consider. Uh, it's also easy to take too much out. So that's something that um, can easily be avoided if you really think about what your actual expenses are versus what you want to take out. So it may um, seem somewhat enticing to take more money out if you can get it. But if you don't really need it, you should take less than, than you need. And um, the reason being, it's a loan, right? So a loan is a loan, just like we said, you're gonna have to pay it back. If you take out $90,000, I'm just giving a, a somewhat ridiculous um, example here, versus taking out $25,000, uh, one, you know, one of those is obviously more manageable than the other. Next slide, please. So um, here, I just wanted to kind of point out that um, it's important to bargain, right? So look out in, into the world and, and there's ways to compare rates uh, online. They've made it incredibly easy for people now um, to, to find loans that may be better suited to them and their lifestyle, their ability to pay and things like that. So do your homework. Um, you know, there's always credit unions, banks, you have a, a great option um, to just consider other avenues. You don't have to go to the first place that's willing to accept your application for a loan. Um, there's no reason why you shouldn't look around and see what's better out there because ultimately you want to save money and you want to avoid going into debt. So look for those low interest rates. Um, look for those, you know, banks or credit unions that are willing to work with you and make sure that you're staying on top of payments later on. Uh, it's good to be a little bit, you know, um, apprehensive about taking out a credit card. Um, it's good to build your credit though, so it's important not to be um, too cautious, but one of the things is you want to manage that as well. Um, credit cards should be for, um, you know, for emergency situations, things like that. It's it's a situation where you want to make sure you can afford to pay off whatever you spend, right? So it's just something that can help you in a situation where you may not have the money immediately. Um, but it's not your lifeline. It shouldn't be something you use all the time. Next slide. Uh, avoiding predatory lenders, especially with payday loans, um, these can be really uh, devastating to your credit. And unfortunately, a lot of veterans do fall into this, um, especially with for-profit colleges and additionally payday loans. So I know that when I was in the military, um, around Camp Lejeune, you could probably find a payday loan place just about every couple of blocks or so. And that's a bit scary when you think about it. Uh, marketing to um, bases has been uh, something that was a problem before 
with for-profit schools. So they were promising degrees that they couldn't deliver on. A lot of veterans were getting out and uh, trying to apply for jobs and not being taken seriously because of the college that they went to. And so they'd also incurred debt because of that. And so here they had a, a huge debt on their hands that they needed to repay and a degree that would not get them a job. So these are the kinds of situations, you know, that we do not want to see veterans get into. So whenever I have an opportunity to talk to veterans about going to college, you know, I, I do remind them to be careful where they choose to go. Um, simply because it might be convenient. I know online classes are really appealing right now, um, especially during this time, but even outside of situations like this, um, online classes can be more appealing, especially if you have a busy lifestyle, if you have family, um, things like that. But one of the great things is that more traditional universities are starting to um, use online courses as a way to um, get people through college as well. So with that sort of adaptation um, in our colleges, we can still adapt to that and hopefully um, use that as an alternative route to our degree. Next slide, please. So what do you do next? Um, and what do you take away from this? So as we said in the beginning, we hope that people make a plan for how they're gonna get to their degree, right? Um, I know that once I graduated college, when I got my first degree, um, I was really excited and I was relieved in a lot of ways. Um, but I was actually really proud of myself and um, I was glad to, to be able to uh, finish when I, when I had planned to and to achieve that goal. So it's something that I hope that all veterans who pursue their GI Bill will be able to experience um, as well. So it starts really though with thinking about your situation. So if you, if you really take some time to actually think through what you wanna do, how you're gonna do it, and when you expect to complete it, it can save you a lot of time, but all these factors kind of have to be considered. So you have to consider the limitations of the GI Bill. You have to create a budget that's going to work for you. You have to balance your course load so that you can get through this college experience without stressing yourself out or letting other areas of your life suffer. Um, so those are things that you have to think about, right? Um, so doing all the research necessary and making sure you're taking care of all aspects of your life, your financial well-being, your mental health, all of these things, um, they're important. Rely on your peers, ask them how they did it, right? There is so many great mentors out there. In fact, you can find mentors online who are veterans who are in successful positions now. Um, I, I tend to kind of mention this one because it's the easy one to find, but there's a vet veterans mentor um, network, right? And that's on LinkedIn. Um, I've actually used that um, in the past. And so if you had, for example, um, a desire to be in marketing or something like that, you could go on there and make a post, say, hey, I'm interested in marketing. I'm looking for a mentor. Um, how do I get into this? How do I get into this job field, right? Um, it's, it's pretty great that there's so many people in that group. Someone will reach out to you, tell you um, what, what are some basic things they need to consider. So it's really reaching out to these um, other veterans groups when you get out to stay connected. Uh, so that connection that you had in the military doesn't necessarily stop there. And I think that that's something that people kind of forget. So there are a lot of veterans out there who will help you. Next slide. So thank you everyone for, um, for participating here. I really look forward to your questions on the subject. And Ben, thank you so much. Ashley as well. Um, it's been really great to be a part of this and I hope to uh, maybe participate in one again in the future. Awesome. Thank you so much, Victor. Um, so at this time, we um, this is going to be our virtual Q&A time. So if you have any questions for either myself, Victor, or Ben, uh, please send it through our chat. Um, Victor, we actually do have one question for you right now. Can you give me one moment? Okay. Uh, so the question is, it was said it was possible to enroll in a quote unquote fun class to break up the stress of other classes. Won't the VA education department not support it as it does not coincide with my educational plan? 
I have had them deny other classes, but was able to enroll as I was able to explain to them that it was needed for a transfer and or to enroll into a certain class. Yeah, so uh, you know, it is good to consider what the VA will cover. So here's a couple things. Of course, if you're talking with your academic advisor, you can double check with them. You can check with um, the certifying official. So if there's a class you really want to take, uh, not a bad idea to do your due diligence and make sure that it's going to be covered by the um, you know, GI Bill or, or what have you. But um, when I took um, my quote unquote fun courses, <laughs> It was, it was at community college, so it wasn't so much of an issue there um, because, you know, there was, there was some leniency for electives and also with the BOG fee waiver, I know it's not called that anymore, but um, with the fee waiver, it didn't really affect my GI Bill or anything like that because it was already free anyway at the college, there was the fee waiver. So um, in that situation, it didn't matter so much, but um, to the person who asked the question, yes, I would recommend um, doing your due diligence to make sure it is covered. Um, and, you know, if, if something like that isn't covered, that's not to say that you can find some other activity outside of the college that might supplement that. Um, there are a lot of, you know, veterans group out there that do hiking and, um, you know, things with horses. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, equine therapy, that's what I meant to say. Um, but, you know, there's other activities you can do, but the main point there was to, to always try to step away from that stressful situation, that demanding environment um, of academics, because it can really start to wear you down after a while. So it kind of goes into your self-care. So how are you taking care of yourself? Um, how are you remaining interested in things outside of just school and work, right? Okay. Awesome, thank you so much, Victor, for that information. Um, so another question I have here for you is, what is the name of the LinkedIn group for veterans? It is just veteran, Veterans Mentor Network. That's all it's called. It's pretty basic. I can probably find a link and send it to you later if you wanna send it out to people. But okay. um, yeah, it's, it's kind of surprising to me because it's rather large. So when I found out about it, um, when I was still an undergrad, it was just something someone mentioned to me and I just joined it to see what it was about. Um, but over the years, um, it's grown substantially and there's people in there from all walks of life doing incredibly different things. You know, I've seen, um, you know, everything from uh, Marines working in the tech industry to, um, you know, you know, folks in the army working in the medical field. So people really just kind of taking on um, new challenges in different career fields. And, you know, these are people who have either finished their degrees and are successfully working in those career fields or people, you know, who are new to the, um, you know, employment market who are looking and finding mentors there. But um, the, the main thing is that, that they're helpful people who want to um, provide you with the advice and guidance. So I would say look for your mentors. Um, that's something that helped me early on was that um, I had a lot of um, older veterans who were willing to kind of coach me and tell me, hey, this is what you need to do um, if you wanna you know, achieve your goals. So I had everything from Navy captains who I talked to, um, to you know, enlisted folks that were in the Vietnam War telling me you know, what to watch out for. Hey, these are things you should take care of early. So, um, find your mentors. They're going to really be able to um, um, guide you in the right direction. So I try to try my best to be a good mentor to people um, of this era and any other year, really. So when people um, contact me, I, I try to make time for them. Uh, it's really important to me to do that. Okay, awesome. So at this time, that's all the questions I have for you, Victor. Um, there was another question on here uh, for myself, and it just says, is there an age limit for dependents on the CalVet tuition assistance? So it just really depends on the, um, oh gosh, I just lost my train of thought, my, your, uh, the plan that you're on. Um, so if you actually go into the PDF there, um, you can it, it would start on page 27 and you can look into those details there um, and then the different um, plans that are available to to you or to the student um, again it's in the veterans resource book and it starts on page 27 
and um, it gives you some information in regards to the college tuition fee waiver. Um, you can always contact us directly as well um, uh, through our phone number, I believe, um, or you can email us as well, and we can help you with that with any specific questions. Um, and at this time, um, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. Um, so again, I just wanted to reiterate, um, if you do have any questions in the future, you can reach out to any of the representatives listed here on um, the questions answer. And, um, or you can reach us on our 1-800 uh, number that's listed on the back of our um, resource book or on the email that you received. Um, again, we are, we will have this recording up and going within the next 24 hours. Um, and then you can also just go on our website to see what kind of webinars that we will have in the future and view any um, webinars in the past. Oh, I think we actually have one last question here. One second. Okay, so um, this is probably just a general question. So Victor or Ben, if you, I'm gonna unmute you, Ben, if you have anything you'd like to add into this. Um, it says, previously before the pandemic, I was in an quote unquote in-class student with the post 9-11 GI Bill still pay out the full BAH for online courses until campuses reopen. Victor, are you aware of that? I know I've seen something in regards to this, but I don't, because um, I don't work for the, the, for that side of it, I don't want to answer something and answer it incorrectly. So, I mean, um, with the pandemic, there are a lot of questions surrounding this. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there's, there's always kind of expected gaps in funding and, you know, during college, but I know that, um, a few people were working on trying to make sure that um, veterans benefits were protected during this time because it's really kind of out of their control in the situation. So we'd worked with um, an agency called Veteran Education Success to, um, you know, send a support letter asking that, you know, Congress consider these things uh, because they are unprecedented, you know, there's no way for folks that who are um, enrolled in school presently to really um, offset that cost. So if it's a shelter in place situation, you're not getting your BAH, it's not the kind of situation where you could just go find supplemental work. Um, and even, even if you could, it's very difficult. So um, it's a bit hard to answer this question in the sense that um, these things tend to move forward rather slowly. Um, I wish that they didn't necessarily uh, move so slowly, but um, we hope that, that veterans will not have to experience too much difficulty during that um, time when it's really not their fault. So I hope that helps a little bit. Yeah, ben, actually I would, something? sure. I mean, you know, I, I don't know if I exactly heard the question, but you know, Congress passed the, you know, the Student Veteran Coronavirus uh, Relief Act or something fairly close to that somewhat recently. Yeah. That, that did a good number of things to protect student veterans. I'm almost sure, you know, protecting BAH levels, you know, with the move to online and some other stuff. So, um, you know, maybe that was the exact question. If there was a move from physical to online, yes, that is my understanding that BAH rates are protected. Um, but, you know, I would also say if, if that person would like to call me, and I'm, I'm sure Victor would be up for that too, if there was something a little more specific there I may not have caught, that's great. And, you know, we, we, we can find, you know, look, look into a you know, more precise answer if there, if there was something there I didn't exactly catch in the question. Yeah. And so uh, what we did was we pulled up the um, education information on the VA website. Um, so you can review this information here. Um, you just go to the VA gov and you would just type in your education and you'll find information out in regards to the edu education and training portion of um, what is going on and then like Ben and Victor stated uh, with their information that they had um, so I know Ben is you know he's has great information so if you have any questions you can reach out to him um, or again any of the links in your actual uh, the link in your actual area but Ben is would be a great resource as well 
Okay. And let's see if we have any last minute questions here. No. Okay. So at this time, um, we're going to go ahead and end this webinar uh, since there's no other questions. Um, I want to thank everyone um, who has been on, who joined us on this webinar. Uh, we all gave some great information. Uh, reach out to us if you have any questions. By all means, we're here to help and assist you in any kind of way. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I just talked it up because I just sent the thing in the chat with the link. Now that we can copy and paste. <laughs>